Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! This week, two of the most pressing issues currently are facing the capital. First, that acute shortage of housing. Then, a little later, our polluted air. As the mayor begins to set out a number of initiatives to tackle it, we look at what lessons can be learned from Paris. Here with us this week, Paul Scully, Conservative MP for Sutton and Cheam, and Dawn Butler, Labour MP for Brent Central. Um, welcome to you both. Uh, I just want to ask them one thing quickly about this issue of social care, which is uh, rising rapidly up the agenda and did so this week. If Surrey County Council were prepared, Paul, to withdraw their threat of 15% council tax rise for social care, uh, there must have been something they were offered um, by government. Are you going to be asking for something similar? What, what's well, look, that's it's, happening? It's, it's interesting that, you know, Surrey County Council, they put up the 15% um, to a referendum, which from what I was hearing, they were clearly going to lose. Um, and uh, they can approach the government to at least acknowledge the fact that it's a problem, which they've done. Cute lobbying, frankly. But uh, what we've done in Sutton, our local council has just passed a motion to say, well, we're not going to ask for any more money, we're not going to um, change anything, but we're going to get our MPs to write a letter, which we've already done anyway, because we do want to be involved in that conversation, because adult social care is a hugely important issue too. To tackle. Dawn yeah. Butler, what do you want? What does Brent want now well, then? Brent wants Nick's number so that we can all get in touch with this uh, Nick. So you can all the text him. The right Nick, yeah, so yeah, that we can yeah. get the same deal. To be fair, people but, could always vote like, Conservative <laughs> next year. But, yeah. no, but it's, Those not, but, but it's not about that because it's, you know, having a sweetheart deal just isn't good enough. Having, you know, numbers that you can say, well, actually, you know, you don't have to do the referendum if, you know, because we're going to sort it out but for Dawn, you. There, there is and no but sweetheart Liverpool, deal. Liverpool next door tried to get a meeting with the government at least four times, possibly more. Next door? And, and well, not next door to where? Sorry, next door to Surrey? No, but, but Liverpool, but not Liverpool, when I last looked. <laughs> Liverpool tried to get a deal and they weren't allowed to get a deal. You know, we, I'd love to have a deal in Brent. We are sure. We need to but take care of the But there is no, there is no sweetheart deal, but, but they, David Hodge has be. been a senior person in the LGA. He sort of knows how local government works and he will be making approaches, as all council leaders should and, and would be doing. So do to, we to make approaches make by these, text? Make these things. Do we make approaches by text? It may be, I reckon, many people are saying we won't see the signs this year, but it may be in subsequent years. We've got to remember this and keep and have a look and see what the settlements are in future years. But we must move on. In the government's housing white paper this week were some potential remedies. More building to rent, more pressure on developers and planners to get construction moving faster. Encouraging greater density in housing developments across the capital. We'll explore how far this could address the acute shortage in the capital in just a moment. After this, from Chanjal Rashid. The housing market is broken because we haven't built enough homes. So says the government's new housing white paper. It announces a raft of new policies to get more houses built. But how will they affect London? All councils will be pressured to release more land for housing construction. The government says many councils haven't come up with adequate plans to meet housing demand. Pointing to London as one of the least dense cities in Western Europe, new planning regulations will encourage developers to pack in more homes and also to deter low-density housing. Londoners on incomes below £90,000 will be entitled to buy new starter homes at a discount of 20%, up to the value of £450,000 in the capital. There's also a particular emphasis on renters, with letting agent fees to be banned. The government says housing policy shouldn't just be about those who want to buy homes. We have to accept that there are some people who won't be able to own, and there are others who will in time, but they're going to have to rent for a period. And if as a government you want to have something to say to everybody, you've got to have policies that both help people that want to own, but also help people that are having to rent. The housing market may well be broken. Will these measures be enough to fix it? Well, let's um, talk about that uh, with James Murray, Deputy Mayor for Housing, and Campbell Robb, Chief Executive of the Joseph uh, Roundtree Foundation. Welcome to you both. Uh, can I start with you, um, uh, Campbell? What did you get from this uh, white paper? What did it signify for you? Well, it certainly signified a very uh, big shift in, in government thinking about 
where housing policy should go. And that's very welcome in the sense that finally policy might start to catch up with the reality of many people's lives who are living in the private rented sector. For too long, successive governments have focused entirely on policy that was about owning your own home. That's become just a pipe dream for so many people, particularly in London. So that's a good and welcome shift. I think we'd like to see a lot more uh, how that's going to happen, how that's genuinely going to be affordable, what type of uh, rental homes are going to be built and how they're going to make that happen. But in terms of a shift of, of view, I think that's a welcome start. Uh, is there a but to that? Is there any kind of caveat? You've... Oh, always, always, I'm afraid. Uh, and that's about the poorest in society. 40% uh, of the poorest Londoners live in the private rented sector. Uh, and this immediately won't make that much difference to their lives. It's how we really begin to see uh, those people who are really not just managing, actually slipping into some very, very difficult circumstances. Rent is one of the biggest things that affects them. Uh, and we need to really get this motoring and getting councils and the mayor really working together because otherwise... Uh, with uh, food and prices going up uh, and wages may or may not go up, we're going to see a lot of people dip, tipping into more trouble. And that's what this housing bill needs to really begin to tackle. Why wasn't it saying, uh, uh, this white paper, why wasn't it addressing that, though? Because presumably you, you, we've, we've seen the emphasis is on affordability, though. It is, and I, and I, I think the challenge is back to politicians uh, around the table to make a case for how uh, all of you really begin to think about some of the poorest constituents in your area. So you're really not going to benefit at this stage from the terrible rents that they're paying in the landlords. The government's done some other things to make the conditions better, but I really believe that if we don't really begin to look at some of the work that they're doing in London, on living rents and those types of things. So we need to begin to control the cost, but we also need to look at the other side. We need to make sure people are getting a decent wage, that the cost of other goods doesn't go up around rents as well. So, so, so it's a whole lot of things we need to see. So James Murray, as you start to feel your way uh, with the mayor to, to coming up with a, with a strategy that deals with London going forward, what did this change for you or, or, or what's different for you now after this white paper? Mm. I think we welcome the white paper. You know, it shows us pointing in a slightly better direction. It shows the direction which we're moving in now recognises that we need uh, different sorts of homes uh, for different people in London. And I think what Londoners have seen is the benefit of having um, a mayor and his team at City Hall who work closely with government to get the best deal for London. Are you saying that because of its focus on rent? You think there's a quite clear shift there to the rent? I think, I think there's a lot of different shifts. There's a lot of practical measures in the bill, uh, in, in the white paper, which show a slightly different emphasis and that we're pointing in a better direction. You know, and there are proposals there which we can discuss with the government in due course. And, you know, it was, it was really encouraging for us to hear Gavin Barwell say on the day that the white paper came out that he's looking to do a bespoke deal with us about greater devolution to London over housing powers, uh, which means it gives us the opportunity to make sure we've got the tools we need in London uh, to build the homes that Londoners need. Dawn Butler, as a Labour MP and someone like Brent, do you feel quite such confidence? Or? I don't feel uh, that confident because... You know, this government has made so many announcements around housing, you know, over a thousand announcements since 2010 around housing, and yet still nothing's been done. I agree that the white paper kind of signifies that it's going in the right direction, but ultimately, you know, we need to build more homes, but they have to be truly affordable, not just 80% of the market rate. In Brent, houses are going for £720,000, 130% more than the average wage. So what we need is more affordable homes. They need to be built and we need more social housing. I mean, this government's you know, ideologically kind of committed to not building social housing and trying to move everybody out and away from their families and from the areas of work, like doctors and but nurses and police Paul, officers. Paul, Paul answered that, and, and, and well, it's two points, because it's Campbell's as well, isn't it, that, that there is a shift perhaps away from ownership, and do you welcome that, or are you absolutely wedded to the old Thatcherite, you know, uh, dream of ownership, but also that it's still not addressing right down at the bottom end of the market, that social, what affordable rents means now, <laughs> is yeah, something yeah. pretty close to market rent. Sure, well, I think uh, in terms of the, the first question, I think Campbell was absolutely right when he said this is a very rounded uh, white paper looking at a range of, uh, of, of um, uh, home ownership and rent. I think that this links in with the need for uh, different types of private solutions in terms of intermediate housing, shared living, and these kind of projects that are already happening and that, that can be encouraged. Um, but one thing that really stuck out, because if you're talking about a lot of affordability, whether it's ownership or rent, 
at the ultimately, it's uh, the starting point is about building more houses. And the thing that stuck out the white paper for me as a former councillor was the uh, ability for local councils to push developers to actually use the planning permission they've got. I haven't been a councillor for seven years, but there's still um, developments that I was on the committee giving them planning permission for that are still but, sitting on a bit of paper. But, but you're the, happy with the, this white paper um, yeah, signals that it's going to be more affordable housing for the people of your area? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the completions that have happened over the last year under Boris, not the planning permission, but the completions, there are already a significant um, uh, amount of those that I think is 38% uh, that, that were affordable. We can have more. There was supposed to be 200,000 new we, houses built. But as I say, 38% of, of actual completions. But, yeah. uh, but, but we, we absolutely need more. And I think this is the start of a conversation. That's the whole point about a white paper. It's not a policy. It's a conversation. It's consultation now. We all need to get stuck into I, actually make it not just a bit of paper, but actually keys that can, are in people's hands. I just, want to ask you, I just want to ask you, okay, hold that thought, I just want to ask James Murray, what does this mean though in, in terms of you shifting uh, how much or the kind of housing you're going to be providing here? How much are you going to go for in terms of ownership? How much is going to be London living rent, a mm -hmm. third of salaries in, in, in areas? Yeah. Well, I think if you look at the deal which we did with government uh, last November in the autumn statement, where we secured £3.15 billion, pounds, and that was for 90,000 uh, new A record homes. for a Conservative government. Well, yeah, and, and I think that shows, you know, London's are seeing the benefit of when you have the mayor and his team at City Hall working with government or to try and get the best deal. a Conservative government that realises there's a problem and, and, and spends that money, whoever's well, think, in City Hall. I think the truth is, everyone in London knows there's a housing crisis. And, you know, as of, we're working with councils across okay. the board. And with one one really simple question, though, now. Mm -hmm. Say you've got your your affordable housing that you, you've promised is going to be half of all the new housing you build is affordable. Of that affordable chunk, how much will be a third of average wages in the area, your London living rent? How much of that chunk? Well, what we set out clearly on the, on the 90,000 homes, I can give you a really precise answer on that one. So the 90,000 homes that we agreed with government, putting the £3.15 billion toward that, around two-thirds of them are going to be for shared ownership or London living rent, and the other third are going to be affordable homes to rent. So how much will be the London living rent, that element? That'll be within the, the two-thirds of the, so the six. Yeah, but how much homes. of it? Because that's the key one that's going to help the poorer people. How much are you going to be helping well, actually, those? The ones which are going to help people on the lowest incomes are the affordable homes to rent. So those, those which are affordable rent or social rent, those are the ones which are helping people on the lowest incomes, which is a question which has been brought up today. Cameron, you're nodding. Uh, you're nodding well, I, I'm, I'm nodding in the hope that everyone around this table recognises that, that uh, and I hope it is a genuinely consultation that we can, because I think there is still a gap within this white paper about what happens to the poorest people in society, either going forward or right now in terms of what they can afford to rent and what they can afford to buy. And I really think that we hope, and we've got lots of solutions and proposals we'll bring to government, for London as well, particularly because we have to recognise it, it's hard harder in London, it's, it's tougher, mm -hmm. there's more need, uh, but it, I think this is a really good opportunity for them to sit down and say, come on, let's put ideology away from this and let's get on with getting some proper and, housing for some of the most... And can I just ask one thing, just to you know, check one last thing, do you, do you agree and do you accept that this is a shift away from ownership and thus we've been a little bit preoccupied with ownership, allowing right to buy or putting the money into shared ownership, this does move away from that? Well, I think, as I say, it's more rounded because I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with... Uh, to meet people's aspirations to own their own home. But Campbell's absolutely right when he, when he started off, you know, talking about the fact that we are living in London in, and, it, and it is a particular, peculiarly broken market, as, as, as Gavin suggested. I'm an out of London MP and the challenges there are getting just as tough as parts of inner London. Um, you know, I've got a son that's renting um, and we've all got those sort of same pressures. OK. Oh, well, um, thanks uh, for you two um, coming. Good to see you. Thank you. Let's Thank move you. on. Sadiq Khan is calling for the government to help scrap diesel vehicles with a generous package of compensation for those owning them. It would cost a tidy half a billion pounds in London alone. The mayor claims he has the boldest plans of any city in the world to tackle air pollution. But Andrew Cryan reports that it doesn't compare to what's being done in Paris. Driving in Paris, not always known for being the calmest of experiences. But getting in a car in the French capital might soon be famous for something else, being almost impossible to do. Take the 10-lane Champs-Élysées, which last Sunday you would have found like this. Once a month, all vehicles are banned and buskers and selfies take over. Lots of selfies. Really, lots of them. So, other than giving people a chance to boost their social media profile, what, you may ask, is the point? Well, the Mayor of Paris is trying to say something very simple. If this, the Champs-Élysées, 
one of the most famous streets in all the world, doesn't belong to the motor car. The city of Paris doesn't either. The mayor of Paris has even said she eventually wants to see the middle of the city out of bounds for every car all the time, with exceptions for residents, deliveries and emergency services. The city of Paris has decided to fight uh, the pollution in the air and, and she's doing a lot of things, many, many, many uh, different uh, projects, but one of them is to uh, bring the most important streets to uh, the users of the city. And it's not just on the weekends. No driver has been allowed up the left or right banks of the Seine since last year. All of which starts to pose big questions about exactly how much Sadiq Khan is doing to fight air pollution in London. Now, the mayor likes to say that London, under him, has the toughest anti-air pollution measures of any major city in the world. But in fact, you only have to get a two and a half hour train ride from St Pancras to find our nearest major rival is doing lots of things that London isn't. Both London and Paris have very similar problems with the air quality readings you get from monitoring stations. It means on a bad day, both cities are capable of having the highest readings anywhere in the world, including big polluters like India and China. In London, the mayor issues a warning, but Paris stops people driving. Every car now has a number, according to how polluting it is. On the wrong day with the wrong sticker, you'll be barred from the city. Paris's deputy mayor for transport told us it's a system that they copied from the Germans, and he thinks London will follow suit. Berlin has shown a significant reduction in polluting emissions, and air quality there has improved substantially. There is no reason why applying this system in Paris should not have similar results. This is why we chose to pursue this path, and I believe London will do the same. Now, the mayor of Paris wants to go even further than that. From 2020, people driving diesel cars are going to be banned from Paris in the week altogether. Now, you compare that to Sadiq Khan. The most he wants to do is introduce a charge so that people can still drive very polluting cars, but they have to pay a little extra for the privilege of doing so. And in France, 60% of cars are diesel, meaning over half of the motor cars on the road are set to be banned entirely. As you might have guessed, it's not universally popular. Please, don't do the same thing in London. Think about all the on all the drivers in their car today. You can't ban somebody to drive. It's not possible. It's something about liberty. So perhaps the real question for London is not whether Paris is doing more to crack down than we are, but what, if any of what they're doing, we should be copying. Val Shawcross is here, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, for Transport. Uh, welcome. Um, for whatever reason, and whatever the explanation might be, do you agree, except that Paris is bolder, bigger, bolder, better? No, I think they've articulated a very, you know, they've communicated a very bold vision, which is great. But I don't think the practical steps are behind it, and I don't think the science is as strong as what we've uh, put together in London. Um, for example, uh, in London, if we pursue the programme we're going through, by, 20, by 2020, uh, we will have reduced the air pollution in London by at least half. So, and that's the, the date at which they're talking about doing a, a diesel ban in quite a small area of Paris. So, you know, the programme we've got is a very practical one and very deliverable. Um, and I'm very confident that what we're going to do is going to make a very, very big difference. But um, how come? If they say they're banning all diesel vehicles by 2020 and you're not, but charging, it'll be the T-charge, won't yeah. it? £10 or whatever it is. How come that is bolder than Paris? Well, you know, we do actually have to go through a transition because if we, we don't have the powers to ban diesel, by the way, but if we did, um, you would find there'd be a rush back to petrol. And in all of this, we've got to balance a couple of things. One is we don't want to increase carbon dioxide emissions, which are much higher uh, from petrol. And the other thing is you have to bear in mind the entire delivery industry in London. You know, the practical things that London needs to run around usually are diesel. So what we want is to make sure 
sure we put enough pressure on enough carrots and sticks uh, to make sure that we transform uh, the, the vehicles running around London to be much cleaner and get people to walk put, and cycle. And put, putting money where mouth is, though, the mayor of uh, uh, Paris does put £500 or offers £500 as that kind of scrappage compensation for people with diesel vehicles. The mayor, you're not doing that. You're just asking the government for it. Well, we... We have put some money into a scrappage scheme for taxis, for example, um, which we're asking really the government to You're not going to do match. much. You're not, yeah. No, and we've also we are going through a program now, which has already been announced, of cleaning up every bus in London, so that by 2020, <laughs> all of the buses and a huge fleet it is in but, London will be will be Euro six standard. So we've got a very practical program that, that that we're going through. It's legal and it's got a very strong scientific base. But no more money is going to be forthcoming from the mayor in terms of private vehicles getting us to get rid of our Well, cars. we've asked the government to help us with that. Yeah, I, I know, but I'm talking do, about the mayor's money. Uh, but, the me but the government actually could find the money if, at the moment, there's a fiscal incentive to people to buy diesel, which we think is completely wrong and outdated. And if they remove mm. that fiscal incentive to people to buy diesel and put it into a scrappage scheme, we'd have a win-win. OK, one more. Uh, Pedestrianisation, well advanced uh, in Paris. Issues uh, sound a bit more sophisticated. Stickers, keeping cars out of on, on polluted days. Well, I mean, how are we bolder than that? Well, we're working on a big programme, as you'll know, with Westminster to look at what we can do with Oxford Street, and that's making progress. We've got a 1. big 9 kilometres compared with we've six. We've got a big Healthy Streets programme which has been funded in the business plan for more pedestrian and walking facilities as well as cycling. Um, you know, so we do have some complementary measures uh, that we're putting in uh, over the next few years which will support this whole programme. Are you uh, disappointed that Paris it appears to be um, bolder than London, Dawn Butler, under uh, a Labour mayor. I'm not uh, disappointed in that I know that the mayor has some funding, for instance, that we will be applying for in Brent. I think it's a billion pounds. Some of my schools are adjacent to uh, the North Circular Road, for example, and the pollution is so high, nine out of ten in the readings, so that I'm going to be applying with the schools to make sure we can pull down some of these fundings for some innovative ways of combating some of the pollution that's happening. So there are some schemes around. I think that we have to push ahead with the diesel scrappage scheme, and I think that has to move forward. I think the mayor and the government has a and role the, At the cost that. of £500 million, uh, which he said this week, asking the government, don't you think it's something the government's got to do? It's got to come out of general tax. Taxation, it's got to come up from somewhere. Well, a scrappage scheme. Yeah. No, well, I think the, the, the thing is, I think Val said it, that um, you do need to have a transition period uh, on this because what I would like to see is th the move from the, the, the fiscal benefits of buying diesel, as happened in the, I think it's the early 2000s, um, allowing people to move not just from a diesel car, but hopefully to electric cars and things like that. I saw Blue Point um, London the other day, and they've got some really um, good pioneering uh, plans to put more uh, charge points in the thing. Because you actually have to have, if you're going to get rid of one car, you have to have them to a, an environmentally friendly alternative. There's no point in just scrapping it for the sake of it. Well, well sure, Cross, let's, let's, let's tie this up. Uh, are, are you saying that, that what Paris is saying is exaggerated because they're only talking about a much smaller area? Or can you name me one area where you think currently Currently, London is bolder, is further ahead than Paris. Well, we'll be starting the T charge, uh, the toxicity charge for the most polluting vehicles, so the pre-2006 vehicles. Um, from the objective is this. October, so that's going to be very, very important. I think there's another thing about the stickers, you know, the congestion charge, which is the technology we'll be using in October, the, the camera-based technology picks up 98% of offenders, whereas if you're using a sticker scheme, you've actually got to have basically traffic wardens. So okay. we're going to have very tight enforcement on the T-charge system. Brilliant. Well, we look, forward, we look forward to this competition continuing. Val Shawcross, thanks very much indeed. Thank and to you too. Thanks a lot.